Hey friends, before we get started, I wanted to tell you about another podcast I'm on. If you're a longtime listener, you know our friends at Castalia Cocktails are a great place to go for a top quality, crafted, thought about drink to enjoy. But what's behind that? Well, my friend Dr. Kevin Peterson has a new podcast called Cocktail Sense, where we together dive into that and talk about how your favorite cocktails come together. We get into the science and art of balance and flavor on Cocktail Sense and have some fun along the way, too. So check out Cocktail Sense in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you download podcasts. And let's get started with today's show. Hey, everyone. How you doing? Welcome to Friday, February 16th, 2024. And welcome to Your Daily Detroit, coming to you from the Daily Detroit studios at Beautiful Tech Town in beautiful Midtown, Detroit, Michigan. I am Jer Stays, and across the table from me is, as he is most Fridays... Devin O'Reilly. A lot of beautifuls there, but certainly warranted, right? Well, I'm in a good mood. We saw that golden orb called the sun earlier this week. I know we're back to February. Yeah, and and the weather's not beautiful. No, but I'll take the reprieve. (laughs) I'm looking at it going, this is all net plus from what you would normally get in a February. I guess if our baseline is, you know, 30 degrees and crappy weather, we're maybe a little above that. So yeah. I guess I'll take it. You've improved my uh, feelings on that, year. So we're going to be talking about actually a lot of economic and development topics today. But before we get started, we're going to play our game of where we've been. And Devin, this time we can play where we've been together. We got a couple of these. So we left our listeners hanging last episode as we were headed over to Z's Villa I hadn't been in a while. It's really close to uh, where we record the show, obviously. And they were open for lunch, which the combo of that is exactly what we were looking for. And I was pleasantly surprised. There was more people than I expected. Mm-hmm. The food was was really good. It, it felt like there was an array of options. So I, I think you had, I'll let you speak to your healthier Reuben, but I got the fresh fried fish. So fresh fried fish. Fresh fried uh, Try saying that three <laughs> times. I won't do it again. The local fish, it was like a, a Great Lakes perch, which I like my fish local. Uh, no surprise. Uh, and they did a really good job. Uh, light fry on it. But they had all sorts of stuff. Everything from sandwiches to pizzas to wraps to fried foods. It seemed like they had it all. It was a great experience. They had obviously a full bar. Their Bloody Mary was not bad. Mm. You know, I was impressed. So uh, overall, it was a great experience for me. How about you? I enjoyed it. I mean, Z's, let's be fair to it. The magic of Z's is often in the warmer months where you've got that whole patio out back, all the, the Wayne State college students and stuff enjoying – you know, volleyball or whatever in the back. But Z's has been around for a long time. They've also got a great upstairs as well. But we are sitting at the bar. It's a cozy space. It's a cozy space. I really enjoyed my sandwich. Now, you said it was healthier. I'm just going to be honest. It's a turkey Reuben, man. Like, it's only <laughs> it's only so healthy that it can be. It's just that I pick turkey over other things that maybe have a little less salt. That was a splurge, sir. It was a good splurge. It was worth it. There's a reason it's been around for a while, right? There are places that persist And it's because they build a clientele and deliver on what they say they're going to deliver. Absolutely. It also, like you alluded to, it did make me yearn for the warmer months when I can sit outside at Z's, which again, it's a great experience. But I think the indoor experience of Z's is a little underrated. It's super cozy in there. You feel like you're in, not I want to say a dive bar, like just like a welcoming like local bar where everybody is pretty friendly and everybody we encountered was pretty friendly. So I grew up on the east side, as people know, and I remember Mama Rose's Pizzeria, which still stands. But back in the day, it was much more of that wood cozy vibe. And I actually remember the Pac-Man oh, I arcade that game. game. Yeah. yeah, like from the 80s there. Mm-hmm. Like that kind of super cozy vibe. Now, that place is still good with pizza, but it's more of a modern uptake now. But Z's, I think it used to be a house. Like you look at that yeah, thing. Yeah, it was like a, an old house, whether it was like apartments or businesses. It's just a big old house and it's got a ton of space and it's a little bit of an oasis in the immediate area. Yeah. The other thing we checked out and we just got back from this, Promenade Artisan Foods. In the Fisher Building. Which I had not not even heard of before, but when you said the Fisher Building, it struck me as, okay, now I'm thinking <laughs> I know where that is because this used to be, uh, I believe it was called City Bakery, opened up for a while. The Blue Tile, the, the very recognizable yes. Blue Tile is still there. That's what like was like a memory trigger because I remember they had opened up from New York City. There was mm-hmm. like the big marshmallows and the hot chocolate. didn't last very long. I no. think there's a lot of issues we don't need to go into. But this Promenade Foods, again, I told you, Jer, I think people are going to kind of forget the name and the signage was a little light. It's going to be the, the cafe in the Fisher Building until they kind of get the marketing better. I literally almost thought about calling my sign guy and being like, what can you do? And just like delivering a sign to their interior space. Because they deserve to do well. It was they really did. good food. It was actually really good food. What they didn't have in signage, this, uh, solid actually – 
you're going to laugh, okay? Somehow, it's a promenade pumpkin spice coffee. It's like very tricolored. I'm looking at it. It's a it's three layers of color here. When I think tricolor, I think France. Okay, well, that's, yeah, that's what they're going for. Yeah. There was even actually a map of Paris in there. There was, yeah. But really good. Actually had a uh, grilled cheese. Mm -hmm. One of the better grilled cheeses I've had in a while because – Thing is, it's easy to go right with a grilled cheese if you do the right ingredients and the right grilling. It's also very easy to go very wrong. Mm -hmm. I have had some not great situations with grilled cheeses, and they nailed it. They nailed it. It was really good quality cheese, everything else. How'd you like your uh, wrap? Yeah, I got the turkey Caesar wrap. It was really good. Very. I went with the lighter option you guys just talked about. So mine had a lot of leafy greens in it in addition to the turkey. It was really good. I got the tomato basil soup, which they, it was one of those – I think they have special. So it, it did seem like – which I appreciate – is one of those places where you probably can't go there thinking you're going to get the same thing every time because it did seem like the mm -hmm. sandwiches kind of changed out depending on what was available. Those, there was only one soup available, and that's what they made that day. Mm -hmm. And when it was out, it was out. And I mentioned, I think I got one of the last turkey wraps because after I got mine, the next person, they said they're all out. So it's one of those type of places. Uh, you, you can't get married to one thing before you go there. You got to be able to mix it up. And they had quiches and, and baked goods, so you could get a lot of different stuff. Yeah, the uh – did the sea salt chocolate chip cookie, which is also a good thing. And because I know that my doctor is listening, don't worry. I'm eating three lettuce leaves and a carrot for dinner tonight. You are a sea salt uh, cookie connoisseur. I have to say, you talk about it inordinately amount of time. The combination of, especially if it's dark chocolate or a darker chocolate chip, oh, the combination of that and the, it all works together really well, if, if balanced correctly. Well, if you if you say it's good, I will take your word for it because as, I, as I've said, you are the connoisseur. So now that you know about a couple of places nearby – uh, let's get into kind of the, the meat of the show. Meat and potatoes, I think we used last, last show. <laughs> Turns out my Valentine ended up being U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Ooh, powerful Valentine. A little bit, a little bit I mean, older than you, She doesn't know Jared. this because I was just there and only was part of like a press gaggle. But, you know, my heart is for 77-year-old economists. What, would that make her a cougar? Janet Yellen. Uh, wow. I, mm. If Spotify demonetizes us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So it was interesting because she's in town. There was a big press push with the Biden administration over at New Lab. Now, that's in the old book depository building next to Michigan Central Station. She did a tour of various uh, like startup presentations there, did a couple of meetings, a presentation. Also spent some time at the Detroit Economic Club with Governor Gretchen Whitmer. This just makes me think a couple things. I mean, one, of course, they've got a message they want to push, of course, and like – Regardless of your politics, Yellen is a very respected individual in her field, whether you agree with her or not. So when she speaks, a lot of people listen. But I can't help but think from now until the election, we're going to hear so much because Michigan is in the crosshairs of this election in so many ways. And I think it's going to be a combination of, you know, seeing victory laps, but also what are the things that we can get for the state and the region in the in-between time? And the debate of like, okay, economically, where do we want to go with this stuff? Let's get ready. I'm not saying this is necessarily the beginning. It's probably already started. But from here on out, the next, what I got, eight, nine months maybe, we are going to be front and center on the, the national stage from a political standpoint because Michigan is really the bellwether state in terms of where this is going to tip. And, you know, we're keeping this no, no like, you know, punditry necessarily. I'm saying depending, no matter who you are, if you are, you know, a Republican – you need Michigan. Your path probably needs to include Michigan. Yep. Uh, if you're a Democrat, your path to victory probably needs to include Michigan. And unlike a lot of other states, I can't really name maybe more than a couple more states, but maybe none so more than Michigan. And even though it wasn't the closest state, you know, in the last election, there were states like Arizona and Georgia. I mean, we're talking 13,000. Biden handily-ish, over 150,000 votes. But still swingable, still swingable. And we've got a lot of different uh, sentiment that's been going on. I do want to talk about October those 7. sentiments yeah. and those those different issues, because I was listening to uh, Debbie Dingle on the Chuck Todd cast talking about how Michigan is still a purple state, even though we have four Democrats in our statewide offices. There's still a lot of purple tendencies. Oh, and by the way, I also learned that Chuck Todd will be coming to the Mackinac Policy Conference. Yeah. Nice so, plug for that. Well, that's one thing I actually want to do. Of all the like celebrities, there's been a few. Actually, I got to meet uh, – Doris Kearns Goodwin, which was super cool. But that's one where I'm like, you have a podcast. You got to show up on Daily Detroit, right? Like it's podcaster and podcaster, whether make, you like him or not. This one's got to be a fit somehow. We're going to make that happen. <laughs> but it's still a purple state in a lot of ways, and there are many issues at play. The international stuff with happening in uh, Israel, Palestine, Hamas, Gaza, all of that, that plays into a huge deal here. And I don't think it's going to be people swinging from Biden to Trump, but Biden to not voting. 
even if it's 50,000, even if it's 40, every single vote matters in this situation. You've got the changing demographics of the region. You've got changing patterns and where people are moving in all of this. There's a lot of things at play. You've got some people doing really well. You look at the surveys. Look, I understand there are a lot of people having trouble making it and feeling like they aren't doing better. But then you also have a lot of people who frankly are. I don't think we have a really good handle on like the situation in general right now, even though it's a little bit of polling. I don't think we really actually have a handle on how people are feeling. Yeah, I think this is one of my pet peeves and we've talked about it, this whole like feelonomics uh, right? thing where it's like- and social media is a fun house mirror. Yeah, I can show you all this data that says the economy is booming, inflation is cooling. We've never been better off as you know individual Americans and Michiganders in terms of the availability of jobs, the pay of our jobs, things like that. I could say we've never been better off. But if you feel like things aren't going in the right direction, if you feel like things are more expensive and life's a little harder, what can I do? I can't argue with that. And I can throw in all kinds of data that shows that in reality, most people just pick their economic condition based on who's president. Sure. Right. They, it just completely correlates how you're feeling mm -hmm. on the economy, on who's in office. There was a thing that a, a few different people shared, I don't remember the original source, but it was a, a source that I trust, that basically most people are just like, well, if Trump's in office, the economy sucks, or if Trump's in office, the economy is awesome, and vice versa, depending on which party affiliation that you have. And in that world, what's the point of facts? Yeah, <laughs> like, it, I don't know what to tell it, you. It's funny, for any listeners who, and if we've got old, old enough listeners, just think back, do that thought experiment in your own mind. Go back to, you know, think of what your whatever side of the aisle you're on, and think about the past, you know, four presidents or whatever, and did you feel like you were in good economic times during them? And if you're a Democrat, I bet you felt better about the economy during the Obama years, the Clinton years versus the Bush years, uh, the Trump years. And I think there will be some who will feel that way. So that's the thing. Inflation's a hard one because here, here's a little dirty secret, I think. And I don't know if you agree with me, Devin, but in a lot of ways, the president's middle management, like there are things they can do to change some stuff but it has an effect over time. I don't know if any president can truly in, like affect inflation that much. Like interest rates are actually not set by the president. They're right. set by the bank. And like, sure, there's political influence and all this other stuff, but there's a lot of this stuff that people look to the president as king, whatever party you're at, but our system is set up so that Congress makes laws. And I would argue that Congress for more than a decade has been a mess and a gridlock and really not able to do their jobs. Right. And you could also argue, uh, especially with the way lobbying and dark money works, that Congress is beholden to corporations, big business, capital B. And if they want to do something if they, you know, they don't want things to get worse for them. I mean, I read something, this is very anecdotal, but something about a TurboTax, for instance, like TurboTax is a huge lobby and they want the tax code to be as complicated as possible because then you'll buy more TurboTax software and you'll need TurboTax more. And if somehow there's a bunch of stuff in our economy it, like yeah, that, if, it's, if it somehow was so simple, we're in tax season. So if it was somehow simplified, TurboTax would not do as well. Therefore, they want to lobby with their millions of dollars to make sure things stay complicated. So you're constantly fighting this headwind. And that goes to the inflation stuff. And you've seen, I've seen the president and some of the other people on his administration come out against like the shrinkflation. Because they're like, well, wait, this isn't us. I'm not the one making less Doritos in your bag. You know, that's Lay's. Yeah, it's multiple layers. <laughs> layers. It is frustrating, though. That's the thing. And when you see things go up so fast, here's the thing that's frustrating for people on the ground. Inflation may be cooling. But I don't think there's really a world where prices roll back. I swear we've, we've talked about this, but I think it merits saying it again. Like there is a certain amount of inflation. When we talk about inflation, we're talking about inflation that's higher than normal at any given point. Things cost more now than they did in 2008. Then in 2008, they cost more than they did in 2000. It's almost an insane and with the definition of insanity, it's, it's an almost insane feeling to think that things are going to go back and somehow be cheaper than they were in 2020 or 2019. That's just not how the world works. Well, and two key points to this is the rise in car insurance across the nation. That's gone way up. And then another thing is the rise in the price of automobiles because that's gone up. And I think about this in the context of this economic visit because obviously there's automotive-related startups. There's mobility-related startups. I want to have one guy on actually who's doing infrastructure for drones. So you could actually do real drone delivery because I guess there's a whole bunch of processes I didn't know about making drone delivery happen and the FAA and all this other stuff. So we'll, we'll get into that. But there's going to be a lot of change happening because knocking on the door are those Chinese EV imports. And that could lower the cost of cars. But then does that also mean a bunch of those cars are made in Mexico? Because like at the end of the day, I feel like everybody says, oh, I want to support the local thing. They want to support the local thing as the plus one. Mm -hmm. What they want first 
is the value. People first make their decision on value than any other thing from where it's made to include, and I hate to say this, but from where it's made to inclusion, everything else, that isn't the lead. That's the plus one. That's the brand. That's the extra story. If it doesn't make value sense, people don't buy it. Absolutely, Jerry. You hit the nail on the head there because some people will pay a premium for stuff that's made locally. And I think even people, I do. And like people like myself, if you have the two options right in front of you and it's not that much more to buy the local thing, you buy the local thing. But at the same time, that's not how it usually works and we know it. The reality is that, you know, Amazon is at our fingertips or other, uh, you know, larger retailers or whatever are at your fingertips and it's just so much easier. And, you know, you can't make that decision uh, 100 out of 100 times. There's some times where you're just going to have to take the cheaper option and it would be really hard for you to just say, screw it, I'm going to I'm going to spend way more in the long Long run on all the things just so they can be, you know, locally made or made in America or whatever you want to call it. So yeah, you want to support job growth and all that, but you also want cheap options and cheap options most likely are going to come from sources outside of this state and outside of this country. Talking about local, let's pivot to a discussion about a report from our friends at the Citizens Research Council of Michigan. We've actually had Eric Lufer on the show a few times. Really interesting stuff. They do great work about explaining what economic situations really are. And I actually went through and read this report talking about the issues that the city of Detroit is dealing with, with attracting businesses, incentives, and all of that. I know this is a topic near and dear to your heart, Devin. So why don't you kind of kick us off a little bit with what your first takes were with it. But basically, there's still a lot of challenges out there. Yeah, yeah, near and dear to my heart. I I don't work on any deals. I want to be clear to anyone listening. I'm not actually someone who deals in tax incentives. So I don't want to... I think but you so, get all the I think arrows on the show. I think, so, <laughs> I think sometimes I talk about it as much and I can't beating this drum. I don't actually have any skin in this game. I've, I've never been involved in a real estate project like this. However, I know plenty of people who do. I see this from a firsthand perspective. And the city's economic conditions have, have definitely improved in the last 10 years plus. But there's still huge gaps that exist in putting together funding, construction, insurance, cleanup costs, ongoing costs, stuff that's out of the city's control. Again, you talk about like the bureaucratic control, stuff that's out of Duggan or the city's hands as far as uh, other costs. It's too much to overcome without some kind of incentives. And there's just no way, I mean, you know, whether you want to bash the, the council's report or what have you, I'd like to see someone show me the case that you can build without incentives. I haven't you, seen you that. You can. Yet. I've seen the case. It's called Residences at Water Square. Well, there And it's also- $2,600 a month plus to live there. Yeah. You know, I, I took our friend Robin Runyon's advice and I looked up myself, plenty of open units there that I don't think they are, uh, they are filling those right now. Did you look at it? No, I haven't. They I, are a ton. I, I, there are others. There are others I know that have filled, but okay. There, you're seeing a lot of empties. There's a lot of empties. Well, it's still uh, early. So, it's so still I'm just early. saying I, when, when it's proved out, whatever, I'll eat the crow. If, if uh, Water Square is 90% occupied, then, uh, you know, hey, Maybe it can be done without incentives. But again, what are you paying? What's the cost? At what cost? What you can't do is $1,500 a month, $1,600, $1,700 a month, and make money on a development. It just can't happen. Well, in reality, when I talk to people off the record, what I'm told is like these city projects, they feel good. They're glad if they're making a half a percent. There hasn't been the margin on them because the costs don't work. And the challenge with that is, is that if you have all these incentives and then you throw in a community benefits agreement, which a lot of people like, and there are things to like about that. But at the end of the day, everything costs money. And so it comes out somehow in the project. Like somebody, It doesn't come out of nowhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. The report also points out how high the taxes are. I mean, that is an issue. Oh, for right? sure. But for they're sure. needed to pay, back, you know, libraries and muni- municipal stuff, police and fire. Like there's a lot of big costs that the city is still incurring that it it needs to have high taxes, but see, unfortunately. But see, but see, that's the thing, though, is that you look at the revenue and go, going into that CRC report, there's actually a chart showing the revenue of the city. You have more people, you would have less of this burden, mm-hmm. right? It's that you're shrinking, it's that you're staying the same, and yet your costs are going up. And so that's one of the reasons why attraction is so important, or new ways of looking at things, or ways to kind of crack this code a little bit. You know, and then the other issue that came up is the controversy around the DDA, the Downtown Development Authority in Detroit, which a lot of people don't like. But I also know that functionally, looking at this report, there's no way you're getting rid of it. I mean, it'll still be around even if it's just a paying off debts obligation. Yeah. To the point where literally I think it's going to be there past the time I retire. Yeah. I mean, what are you – And yeah. I'm not looking at retiring right away. What are you really doing by abolishing it? I know that's kind of caught on as maybe a little bit of a, a buzz thing. You might hear more about you know, we got to abolish a DDA to fix things. And much smaller, but I sit on a DDA. So I do have some direct exposure to this. And the report kind of comes out and says a reasonable person – have come up with reasons why you might want to or should end the DDA. Or end new projects with the DDA and wind it down. Sure. However, there is still $571 million plus 
needed to pay bond and debt secured by the tax capture. So this report states that the DDA couldn't even be dissolved because you still have to pay those bonds off until 2053 at the earliest. Yeah. So it just doesn't make sense. There are still debt obligations and uh, you know bonds that need to be paid off. And I believe that the DDA does have a function. Well, I mean, that could be a whole episode in itself. I think, can I say something? I will say this, Jerry. I think the transparency could be improved. I will 100%. say that. I think that people view the DDA as this shadowy cabal of decision makers in a smoke-filled room that make all these decisions. And from my experience, that's not what it is. But I don't think that the city of Detroit in particular does a good job of having the transparency around the DDA process and what they do, when they meet, what they talk about. I, and I'm going to be bold on this one and say, in reality, although there's so much public discourse about it, it's kind of the extra plus one afterthought. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not the center of any of these people's businesses. Right, yeah. It's like the extra thing that they do as part of the community or, or trash pickup. I was actually talking to a listener who didn't realize that like Campus Marshes Park, West Riverfront Park, all those things, those improvements are not being funded in part mostly by the city. They didn't realize that. They thought all of that downtown stuff is happening from the city coffers. There are city elements to that, but like uh, one of the Ford family raised the money for Campus Marshes Park around Detroit 300. And, and now DDP operates all the parks uh, in downtown basically. Right. And what that does is it takes that off of the city's burden list. Mm hmm to do more things. At the end of the day, we need an aggressive growth strategy as much as we would like to manage decline or you have to go in and rip up all of the costs of the city. And you are going to have to be brutal in a way that I think a lot of people's political ideology won't like mm -hmm. of what does the city not do? Because there's only two ways to address this issue. It's yeah. either add more or to you, you do both. And you say, what does the city not do anymore? Or doesn't need to do. But those are, like you said, those are tough decisions and conversations that I don't really know if people are going to be honest with themselves about having. I don't know. Right, because everybody it. wants everything. And it's right. like, well, why isn't it like this or that? Well, you've got underlying cost structures that suck. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what else to say. Yeah, we're, I mean, you're going back to like the sacred cows, police, fire, schools, libraries. I don't know, where do you, infrastructure, where are we cutting? I, I mean, I mean, what do we, what, <laughs> you get to those and you, you people aren't ready to make those decisions, nor can they agree on what's a priority if I listed those five big things. Yeah, and so to me, I feel like it's, it's about a growth strategy, but that's only one person's opinion. I'd love to hear what people think. DailyDetroit at gmail.com. You know, it's funny how we look at things in the past and there's so many things that are legacy costs or legacy things that just exist that we have to deal with. And I don't know if the public kind of understands that. And that's one of the reasons why I'm really glad the CRC report exists. There is going to be a second part to Detroit City Council. I do want to have an episode talking with them about unpacking this, especially when that second part comes out. Because I think there's so much knowledge that they have unleashed a link to the report. It's a nonpartisan report. It doesn't come out with what you should do. It comes out with like this is the situation. I think that knowledge is important because I have learned there is so much of this conversation that people don't realize. Like like trash pickup downtown. Mm -hmm. That's not a city function. That's also, not a city government function. Also correct. But people don't think about that. They think that the money is getting like, like taken away or whatever to make more down there. But – so that's right. that's, so that's a hard part. If the this. DDA didn't exist in the downtown Detroit partnership didn't exist then the city would have to pay for trash collection downtown. And where is that coming from? Yeah, I'll say it again because I think it's important. The DDA tax capture is not taking money from the residents of Detroit as much as it is taking money from people who come and visit Detroit and work in Detroit and, you know, come to sporting events in Detroit. So for better or worse, may, may, you know, maybe you don't like to hear that, but the main function of the DDA is actually capturing that above and beyond tax on things from people who come into the city to work and play. Uh, it's not necessarily cutting into residents, you know, taxes. This is in the report, but that if but for argument, well, if it didn't exist, it wouldn't happen, is actually really hard to make, at least according to the data. Neither side has strong ground to stand on on this one. As far as looking at the data saying, well, if we didn't have the DDA, would this happen? Would this revitalization would have happened? If you ask me, I don't think it would have. I would agree with you. But. I don't think it would have because I know what it's like in those decision rooms to an extent. I haven't been super close to the metal, but I've close, been close enough to know that, honestly, if you want a low cost set up in Livonia, Canton, Troy, I know lots of people who live in the city who have their businesses set up wherever because it's just easier. So yeah. it, just, it just is what it is. So you can have like this ideal – but then you have to live in the real world. And I think there's a lot of people who don't understand. Like, th there's a lot of value and there's a lot of heart. And I understand where a lot of it comes from. But it doesn't check out with reality. I would agree, Jerry. I, I like to think that I live in the real world for better or worse.
Well, this is a little bit different of an episode for us for Friday, but we got into it. When you get in the studio, Jer, I feel like the conversation becomes much more loose and hopefully people enjoyed our our banter. One thing I will say, people loved having everybody around the table. Yeah, well, definitely. Well, I would, I would love to do that more. 100%. Bring everybody in. It was good to have that push back and back and forth because all you, Norris and Cheyenne, all have differing opinions on things. Yeah, I guess, you know, I, I have to say, I don't know. I don't know if listeners feel this way. I certainly do. I mean, even listening as a listener and a contributor, there is no way someone could make the case that Daily Detroit, like, beats to one drum. We are in a good way all over the place in terms of our opinions, values, perspectives, and all that. So I think that makes for a good conversation. This is one of the reasons why I think I'm going to add Cat Herder to my bio. Because mm. it's just all over the place. I'm not a cat guy. <laughs> That's another hot take, I'm sure. <laughs> Dogs all the way. We'll also make sure to get in Engineer Randy and, of course, catch a wild Fletcher once in a while as too. Whenever we can grab him. And yeah. Robin, always, always welcome all that. We always get great feedback on her episodes. Yeah, whoever wants to stop by, we'll get Robin and uh, Robin and I should do one. And take that as my thank you to all of you for helping contribute to the show. We've got some big things coming up. We've got more newsletter editions. We've got a new website coming. Uh, I've got a new piece that I was teasing in yesterday's show up on Crane's forum, talking about the future of media. That could be an episode in itself in the future. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot going on. There is. And we're, we're finally staring down spring and some really big things that are going to be happening in the city events and things that are going to be fodder for a lot of conversation between you and I. I'm just glad that the sunsets are starting to get in the right spot again. Right. That helps my soul so much. One of the nice benefits on, of being on the edge. Another way Detroit is better than New York. Our sunsets are later. Yes. And way better than Chicago. I love having late sunsets. You know, yeah, unlike those cities that are like urban jungles, there's not enough buildings in Detroit that blot out the sun that you actually get a good sunset, even if you're kind of downtown. Oh, and like through the trees and everything, it's wonderful. Anyway, thank you so much, everyone who's contributed. Thank you so much to our members on Patreon, patreon.com slash daily Detroit. We have rocks classes for you if you join us as a member, as well as we're going to be doing some video exclusive as well. With that, I am Jer Stays. I'm Devin O'Reilly. Thank you so much for listening. Remember that you are somebody. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll talk on Monday.